thanks a lot first for being here and for the invitation to, to talk with Jeffrey. First, I have, I don't know if it's a confession, but I, I have to speak about my generation. And I hate that word generation because uh, I'm not talking about architecture of, uh, or architects of my generation, but of politicians of my generation. Uh, I am almost the same age, one year younger than Mexico's current president and Mexico's city current major. And if you have heard of them, and if not, it's the same thing. They are not doing well. And they are not doing well in terms of this um, hope that we have sometimes in people changing things and uh, transforming things. So instead of being, they, they, they call themselves representatives of the politics of the new, but they are a kind of repetition of and failure and a tragic farce of, of, of what we already seen too many times. So uh, I don't know if I identify with myself with this kind of, of guys of this generation, but, but that makes me uh, things to think. And I was telling Jeffrey that at the beginning of this year, in March, we were preparing an issue of a magazine in Mexico. I'm the editor of Arquine. And the subject was futures in plural. And we began to read, among other writers, the ideas of late Mark Fisher, this uh, British uh, music critic and, and, and political critic, who has a book that is called uh, Ghosts of My Life, and where, he, where, he, where he speaks on the impossibility to imagine coherent alternatives to the current system, state of things, or usual business. And in a way, I, being of the same generation of the president of my country and the mayor of my city, two guys that have failed, uh, obviously, in the way of imagining a new future or a future for our country or our city, I kind of uh, agree with the ideas of Max Fisher, with this idea that we are living, he says, the, the, the first chapter of his book is called The Slow Cancellation of the Future. Um, and he speaks about anachronism and inertia, about a stasis, a place that we're stuck on, that is buried behind a superficial frenzy of newness, of perpetual movement. And he says that this slow cancellation of, 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 of the future can be proved in his term uh, with a thought experiment that he, 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 he explains. He says, if we could send a record done in the last couple of years, 15 years or 20 years in, in, into the past to 1995, uh, no one would be surprised with what they are hearing. They will recognize the music. They will recognize what they are hearing. Uh, and for him, this is this idea of repetition, nostalgic repetition that he takes from the, from the work of Frederick Jameson, the idea that um, Anything is coming back again, and you can see it in the if you if you put one and together uh, uh, beside the other the posters of uh, Star Wars and the newest version of Star Wars of the posters of Train Spotting and the second version of Train Spotting, you will see that it's like history repeating itself once and again. So this problem for 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 for, for Fisher is a problem that has to do obviously with well obviously for him with politics and the economic situation we are living in, where people are no longer able to find the space and the time to imagine the future, because they are stuck in trying to solve their present. And that I, those ideas uh, of Fisher that maybe, maybe if you hear this, well, the, 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 the subtitle of his book is on depression and something else. So obviously, he's a melancholic. He was a melancholic. He was depressed. And he was not an optimist. And I was told once in Mexico that you cannot be an architect if you are not optimist. And probably is right. And probably that's why, that's the reason because I sometimes present myself as a former architect, so because I'm an, an editor. Uh, but I was thinking in, in the way that the, the things changed in, in, in maybe in a hundred, in a hundred years. Uh, I love this, uh, this, this, this. Uh, I like a lot this, this uh, lecture by William Morris that he gave in 1840, 1884, uh, the way we live and how we could be living, it's called. And he says that we need a revolution. Obviously, Morris was uh, a friend of Marx and Engels. He, 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 had, he dined with them. And the idea of a revolution was present in his, in his 
not only his aesthetics, but in his poetics, uh, thinking that design could help revolution. And 40 years later of, of, of William Morris, we have Le Corbusier saying that instead of revolution, we need architecture. So it's like canceling one to having the other. And going out of, 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 of architecture, going into uh, critical theorists or, or, or thinkers, uh, in Mexico, for instance, we have Octavio Paz, who in 1974, he spoke of the problem of modern poetry. And he said that poetry, modern poetry had, had been brought into existence with the idea of a rupture, a breaking with tradition which is difficult if you think on, of, of uh, English uh, language poets as bound up or Eliot, which they didn't broke with tradition in that sense. They broke it in another sense, they reinvented a tradition. But what Octavio Paz is saying is that modernity was a rupture with tradition that later became a tradition of rupture, of having to invent something new all the time. And that also t took me to, to uh, uh, an American uh, critical theorist uh, or, or, or thinker, uh, Marshall Berman, who also, he, he, he made a difference between modernity as, a, as an epoch, as an era, modernization as the impulse, economical and technical impulse to change everything, and modernism as the critical way of thinking on that period and that uh, change. And, then I realized that maybe uh, late Mark Fisher, late Mark Fisher, he, he suffered for, of what we could call uh, critical nostalgia also, because the things that he was saying were already said in the 50s or in the 60s, this idea of the impossibility of, 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 of the new, of, of, of modernity changing every time, everywhere. And then I got into Jeffrey text, uh, towards a, a new architecture from 1993, where he asks himself and he asks us what is the possibility of a new architecture. Uh, he, he says that new architecture would have to, uh, would have to uh, comply with two conditions, uh, a form of vitality and political relevance. And he also stated there that in that time, 1993, History was understood as a shapeless well of recombinatorial materials, always deep, always full, always uh, open to the public. And uh, that the idea of revolution had been changed for the idea of accelerated evolution. And also that uh, this idea, uh, that we had to, 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 uh, to approach to this idea of a new architecture to erase the logic, well, to avoid, sorry, the logic of erasure of, of modernity and replace it by a logic of participation and reco reco recomposition, recombinations. Um, all of this makes me think of a, of a short story but of, by uh, Argentinian writer Jose Luis Borges that is called Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote, where he explains of this guy that he wanted to rewrite the Quixote in, in the 20th century. And the trick was to do it not as reimagining himself as living in the time of Cervantes and writing it all, all over again, but to write it in the capacities or abilities of a people living, of, of someone living in the 20th century, and how to rewrite the Quixote in, 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 that, in that position. And Borges says in that short story that Menard, he arrived to, to, to write a couple of lines or paragraphs of the Quixote, uh, and that those single lines of the Quixote of by, by Menard, uh, Borges says that they were greater and more, more valuable than the ones written by Cervantes, because for Cervantes that was the natural thing to write, while for uh, Menard it was a, a huge effort to do what it was not natural for him to do. So what I wanted to, 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 to try to, to, to talk, uh, to discuss with, with Jeffrey was this idea of the new, the possibility of the new in architecture and to obviously, I, I, well, I don't know if obviously, but after reading your text, this text, I think that you are more optimist that I could be, uh, maybe by, by, by this idea of my generation sharing it with Fisher and my president and my major. So, <clears throat> that article is 25 years old. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, actually, <clears throat> it was a success. Everything it called for to happen, happened. About, took about 10 years, 12 years. Now it's long gone. <laughs> so we, uh, we had that new architecture. <laughs> um, let me remark on a few things. First of all, I am an optimist. Um, only because everywhere I look, optimism for me is confirmed, authentically confirmed by the processes that I see um, in virtually every field and in all the way in the way fields develop and continue to evolve. I'm not a revolutionist. Mm -hmm. um, I probably was at that time. I think you're probably right. Um, I've always tried to steer against theorizing revolution. Um, and steer, rather than theorizing how one positions themselves into to micro evolutions. Remember 25 years ago there were no computer, uh, the first Photoshop that had been published for the project had just gotten published. Computers were just starting. We had just started in the, the digital time and um, the mobilization and agility of um, <coughs> of matter in every discipline has been so accelerated now that evolution is far more um, threatening than revolution. That's the problem with social media, uh, fake news. All, all the problems that we're seeing today are not problems of revolution. They're problems of small-scale evolutionary changes that are destabilizing very important structures in ways that revolutions never could. Are you, I mean, do you follow, do I need, do you need examples? Uh, you know, so I think, you, are you following my story? Is it, it turns out that evolution is much more threatening than revolution, particularly when there's intentional evolution. And, um, so it's a very exciting time to be an optimist. <laughs> and you should be very pessimistic about it. <laughs> um, also, There's a certain way that I'm a Nietzschean. I remain a neo-Nietzschean in the sense that uh, if, thing, if something is going to happen, it's going to happen, so be it. So I don't moralize. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not critical. I was born into a critical group. I gained my position in the world, like you, caring and wanting to be part of a critical practice. They just... I didn't like hanging around with them. It was Mark Wigley and Beatrice, and they weren't cool enough, and I wasn't smart enough, and so I wanted to hang around with a cooler, not so smart group, so I jumped ship, <laughs> and I became post-critical. So I have no faith in the critical project, mm -hmm. and I worry about your faith in the critical project. But most of all, I worry about your faith in the production of criticism by textuality. And the worst people of all that practice that with such glib sophistication are English writers. Chris Hawthorne, Mark Fisher. <laughs> so I can tell you with, abs <clears throat> with absolute confidence, and I can do this in any discipline, that you can take his remark that you can take a piece of music from today and set it back 15 years ago and not shock anybody. <clears throat> and I can start listing pieces of music from any genre, from new classical music to new rock and roll to new, and I can continue to send pieces of music back 15 years that nobody will recognize and never stop, never blink an eye. And I can also continue to send back pieces of music 15 years that anybody will recognize because so much music is being produced today. And so much music of so much variation that no one can track it and no one can keep up with it. But it just happens to be an interest of mine and I know he's just wrong. He wouldn't say that about literature. He wouldn't say that about any other discipline that he had. As in, he says that about the area of music that he feels like he has some expertise in because he has no idea about what's called non-pop, contemporary classical mm -hmm. music. So I don't mean to, because he's a great journalist. 
he produces a great journalistic effect. And I have no respect for journalistic effects. <laughs> do you understand? So, yeah. but let's talk, but I do think it's very important to talk about the future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, so I admire you for being stimulated to think about the future as a problem, regardless of whether your sources are convincing to me or not. So it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to get them right, and they don't have to be right for you to be on an interesting track and a provocative track to ask questions about the future because every time the future comes up in architecture, it's, a, it's always a disparaging moment. You know, The Better Future of Architecture was an essay written by Robert Mangurian Unger at a time, changed my life. He rewrote the five points of architecture to correct them in a moment. I rewrote that essay at a parallel time. Um, and so what he was trying to do is uh, abstract the five points into, into a sociological project. So he took, so instead of free facade, it was blank, I don't know, blank, vast, pointing. Mm -hmm. So these were characteristics of architecture that he, if you, he believed, he, he was, he's a sociologist, a Brazilian sociologist of great importance, working now with Cornell West. And he felt like if architecture would just simply take up these architectural qualities, it could mobilize itself in, in a political way without taking up a direct political project and actually impact the future uh, in a way that it had never imagined it would do. Because this idea, for example, of modernism, that it could produce a better future by standardizing, by disassociating itself with the operations of power and prestige and producing a higher standard of living for more people by using the standardization practices of an industry was just too naive, economically naive, and all of those failures that were well known. And so he felt like an abstract vocabulary of aesthetic, of cultural aesthetic production might help. And that's where um, some of those articles came out of. You, and in your work and in your writing, this, you know, so, to, so what would it mean to think about the future, but the question then becomes, the future for whom? Mm -hmm. You know, and this, we still hold, and we're almost impossible not to hold uh, some kind of collective. Mm -hmm. You know, so earlier today, and you know, this is, if I say critical regionalism, mm -hmm. the thank God for, thank God that that article is even older than, you know, that's 45 years old. <laughs> and, you know, so there, this was an idea, a fantastic idea by one of the great thinkers in all of architecture, still alive. Nobody wants to meet him. How many of you want to meet Ken Frampton? How many of you ever heard of him? You had a chance to go meet one of the great thinkers of architecture, See, meet him in person, hear what he has to say. Nobody goes and do, does that. You know, when Einstein was alive, 35, 40 years after he, way past his creative life, when he was literally, you know, uh, drooling in his soup. <laughs> there were still people lined up in his, you know, but this, Ken is just walking up and down New York City, you know, hi, I'm Ken Frampton, you know, can I borrow a quarter? And, you know, he's a great man, better than uh, Colin Rowe and Tafori. And, why he was so great is he took two ideas, Heideggerian existentialism lo located in the material practices of a place and joined them to Marxist, neo-Marxist economic thought about the formation of a, of a person and a people in relationship to material practices and global economics. And he realized that the apotheosis of that combination was gonna be an architecture. And so he produced this concept of critical re re regionalism, which was a, not about the future, but about a practice that would keep architecture engaged in the politics of the present as it moves forward. And it failed. It failed not out of, in, out of incompetence, but out of the fact that he was so good at it, he showed that there was some fundamental problem in the conception of it and opened up the door for me and all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, so with somebody, so when the Michelson-Morley Michelson -Morley experiment in physics proved that there was no ether, they didn't fail to find the ether, they opened the door up to, you know, to Einstein, you know. So this is a, 
epic moment for me, and mm -hmm. you know, and uh, then all hell broke loose for all sorts of technological reasons. So what? That just happened to be what happened at the moment, you know. And but we do have to think. So when you say something about the better future, I keep wondering for who and and in what way. Better future. What I think of as a better future now is an architecture that uh, speaks more with greater subtlety and um, uh, fineness to a broader, a broader existential spectrum. In other words, not trying to identify each group mm -hmm. and politically enfranchise it through representation or, or economics. Let's say neither, uh, neither um, Chris whatever his name is, and, you know, what is the guy's name? Christopher, you know, it, Berkeley, yeah, Alexander, or, um, Car or, yeah, thank you, old guy. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, you know, or, or uh, Alejandro Venice Biennale. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so those are noble causes, but they're so ham-fisted that they're, they just, they're not credible but, you know, to pick those kinds yeah. of populations to decide you're going to stand in the name of. So what future? For whom? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's the question, maybe. I, I, when, you, when you said it, I, I remember this uh, sentence, this phrase, I think about William Gibson. Uh, the future is already here, but this is not evenly re uh, distributed. Yeah. But, and, and by the way, it must not be. It must not be evenly distributed. Uh, even distribution, any classical economist will tell you mm -hmm. that once you evenly distribute, once you have equilibrium, mm -hmm. the other word for equilibrium is death. There has to be a source and a sink and a movement of energy from the source to the sink in order to keep a system alive. So every time, uh, you know, will every time, in, I'm sorry, my brain is just gone. I outsource my brain. To, you know, to everybody around me, and when they have to shut up, I don't. So that's why I need old guy, and I need all these people. So who's M of MVRDB? Vinny Moss. Mas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he gets up and he says, uh, you know, the United, United States uses. If everybody in the world uses uh, four, uh, the same amount of resources as the United States, we'd have to have four and a half times the pot. You know, whatever mm -hmm. it is, we yeah. use four and a half times too much. And I keep saying, is that all? You know, <laughs> we need to accelerate. There, you have to have a disequilibrium and an imbalance of the use of resources in order to produce, have production. The problem is the unfairness. You know, let's say in the United States it's always white men mm -hmm. that, and have been for 200 years. So it's not that there's a disequilibrium it's that the same people get to do it over and over and over again because there's uh, instantiated structural unfairness. And so what we need to do is exactly what you said earlier, mm -hmm. and I thought that was a beautiful thing to do, but, what we, but we don't know how to do it is quite how to do it in architecture, which is why Liam Young is such a genius, is you have to imagine worlds first in which new forms of arrangements, new forms of property, new, you, you have to imagine futures in which uh, new possibilities of um, all kinds of enfranchisements occur. That's, mm -hmm. where, that's why I don't particularly like the word fiction because it's so writing-based. But um, if in, in the world that we were to grow up in, you were gonna be rich and poor four or five times because there was no structural guarantee of your maintaining your wealth, you would distribute and use your wealth differently. You know. Uh, Another example I give, and I know people are tired of hearing of this, is if you're a heroin addict, you're producing property. Every time you see a movie and there's a heroin addict and uh, the director and the writer and the actor have all gotten paid for there being a character called a heroin addict, mm -hmm. you're out there being the heroin addict, you've produced that property, but not according to Marx's theory of labor, but because of an existential theory of value. I mean, you know, Marx's theory of labor theory of value is you work, you produce mm -hmm. value. Just the existence of everybody on the street, every time you see a crowd, so everybody's producing value. We have the way to account for the value. NSA can record every living thing that happens, store it, and we can evaluate it. So we need ways to produce entirely new, uh, entire new rep repertoire 
of narratives, not stories, that include all of the practices, including architecture, and not worry about actually how it's dedicated in a particular vector towards this future or that future. So, so for me, it's more about mobilization and misbehavior than it is about theorizing a better future and instantiating it. Those always go wrong. Now do you, do you speak about uh, heroin users? I was remembering this work by uh, the artist Santiago Sierra, who, yes. who, who he tattooed yes, yes, this line yes. in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the backs of, of, of heroin users, changing it for a dose of heroin, producing money because he sold the work, but also producing uh, at least in his terms, that was a disruptor in, in the social way of accepting money and the relation to drugs. But maybe the Hollywood movie doesn't do that, doesn't disrupt the reality. So no. do, we, do we have to bet for disruption for this slowly evolution that maybe it won't equalize us all, but that will change things for as many people as it can? Well, I just think it has to, I mean, you know, here's the thing I like. Let's say you do that for heroin addicts. Now, next thing you know, you're going to have women heroin addicts thinking, well, you know what, we're, we're not getting our fair share. Or, you know, then it'll start to bifurcate in its own ev evolutionary thing. And I'll, 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 what happens when then every, when the NSA's got every recording and caught every spy and stopped everything and then we got all this equipment? We got to do something good with it. You know, you got to write some stories, and we got to put a sensor in every building, and all this sort of stuff. And you know, uh, then you'll see the incredibly fine-grained differences. That every time I watch TV, and any good writer has written any kind of show on TV, there's 500 kinds of gay people. There's 50 kinds of uh, every form of character, every form of economic production. And then you look at the sets, and they're that agile, and you watch stand-up comedians. But, but then you get to the architecture. When you start to see graphic design, you, you'll, you'll see that there's a sense that the, the ability of material practices to respond at the imaginary level is super sophisticated. Something happens that's got nothing to do with functionality or cost when it gets into the measured world of sobriety and responsibility at the level of a city. But oddly enough, it diff like Mexico mm -hmm. City versus uh, New York City versus mm -hmm. Los Angeles versus Ohio, the ways that the um, restrictive dictums mm -hmm. uh, decide what's in good taste, what's in good manners, are just accepted and taken for granted. I mean, this is why I keep saying there's something really useful about Trump's outrageous behavior. We don't know how to keep up with it any, anymore. Well, that, that, that's what she said, uh, proposition, or that voting for, for Trump would be better than voting for Hillary. Well, that was, <laughs> you know, I said that, I thought making George Bush Jr. president with Cheney was gonna, was a great idea, because it was surely gonna ruin the Republican Party, and it did you know, for eight years. <laughs> but now, I, I was thinking that you spoke about uh, gay characters appearing in, in, in movies and all of that. The difference between, for instance, I don't know, uh, William Grace making being gay normal in national broadcasting TV. Uh, and the difference of that between, uh, compared to, I don't know, the Stonewall, the first Stonewall is the March manifestation in New York. Yes. So one is, Yes. A, a political act that wants to change reality, and the other is completely depoliti depoliticized. They, they, they don't care for politics. I, I mean, in, in I know, but what's true now, what's not true, is that this map becomes a, uh, a what they used to call in the 80s a, um, what they call a, 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 the head discourse, master discourse that all other, mm -hmm. that will map out for mm -hmm. all the other discourses. So the way architecture will, in its broadest sense, I don't mean just designing buildings, but in its project base, all of its possible projects, publication, writing, mm -hmm. models, every possible way, the way it will produce its own jungle, its own habitat of jungle, isn't gonna be a subservient version of H, um, LGBTI mm -hmm. maps, or not going to be, or the music map, 
So they don't have anything to do with each other. You know, they just, they're gonna become, they, they tend to be isomorphic parallel maps. And this idea that you have a theory of the future or a theory of where we all fit in is so long discredited and so easy to show that there's never been a, the kind of direct causal exchanges between them that we just get frustrated so you end up with a really bad, you know, you do have to keep imagining the potentials, keep trying to realize the potentials, keep, stop making promises. It's the hardest thing to teach <laughs> is stop making promises, just find audiences. Find audiences or build audiences because, well, I mean, right now, it, Pick somebody who has the absolute smallest audience in the entire world of architecture. <laughs> that would be Hernan. <laughs> <laughs> Not audience in terms of fans, he has a lot yeah. of fans, but in terms of someone who doesn't, a group of people who are not, are taking seriously the fact that his, the being in the world of his work isn't a necessity. It's way behind the fact that the being in the world of his work is a necessity, you know, and everybody keeps getting nearer and nearer and nearer. You know, there's nothing too hard about it. There's nothing too dangerous about it. There's just something, you know, it's not a necessity. And it's not a necessity, not out of what damage it will do, but out of what politess it will challenge. It's bizarre. And, that, and yet you can look online at thousands of buildings that are stupider, just flat out stupider, more expensive, more ridiculous. The th those three kings in uh, China, that mm -hmm. Moshe Safdie three towers with a gigantic boat on the top. I mean, how dumb is that? I mean, it's a kind of neat thing, but it's, what, what does that do for the, what is that for the world? <laughs> I, I like the, the reference to Moshe Safdie because would, would we agree that Habitat 67 was a challenging project, a, a, a promise for the future. Absolutely. And what happens with architects and with architecture when it is swollen by the, what, by what? I would, I would say the system, but we are, you are going to fight me if I say the system. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, what I want to know is that there have been some fantastic promises for the future in architecture. Have any of them succeeded? But they've all succeeded as architecture. Like that's a great, that is still a great project, even though it didn't do what it, mm -hmm promised, best thing that can happen to a work of architecture that makes a promise is when everybody moves out of it. And then we, you know, we get this, you know. So I don't think, architecture is a, is a different kind of production. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important that it tries to work and that it works sometimes. You know, I think Lafayette Park, for example, I don't, most people don't even know it, is an unbelievable, successful Mies housing, pro, housing project mm -hmm. no one knows about. Nobody, nobody flocks to, Lafayette Park to study how one middle-class Mies housing project near Detroit works. Yeah, it is. It works because not so good, not so bad, not so good, got changed a lot. So it's an art, it's not an art, but it's an art form. It's a form of, so there's always this struggle. You struggle with it mm -hmm. because you circumscribe a problem and you keep trying to figure out how to end the, end the, I don't know, end the fanfare with a concluding picture of success. I don't know if, if, if uh, What I'm, would a success be in your terms? No, I, I'm. That's why you're, that's why you've given up on your optimism. No, I, I think that's a, 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 a deeper problem that, I, that has to do with my psychiatrist, not with, with, <laughs> with, with the you're, time I'm living. You're not even Jewish. No, I'm not. Or Catholic. And I don't have psychiatrists. Are you it's, Catholic? It's, it's, it's a joke. Are you Catholic? No, no, yes, no see, longer. I, I, was, I was raised a Catholic, but I'm not, I'm not longer. You're just, no, but I, you're just I, I, smart. I, I was interested in what you said of Mies and Lafayette Park because we were, uh, well, I quoted you about the two conditions of a new architecture that you wrote 25 years ago. Uh, formal vitality and political relevance. Yeah. And if I compare Lafayette Park to uh, Lakeshore Drive, the formal vitality is the same. You think? Uh, Lakeshore Drive is a... 
is it, stronger. It's, it's got a better sight. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, yeah, it's a little stronger. But they, they're close. And the political relevance? What, what changes there? Between uh, rich people live on Lakeshore Drive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, those, those kinds of things matter. Yeah, know? I know that matter. Does architecture has anything to do that? Can change anything to do? Or William Morris was a very romantic, idealistic guy thinking that revolution in design can help people. Uh, revolution in design can help people. There's no question about it. For example, running water, uh, you know, mm -hmm. running water, plumbing. Pretty much as yeah. soon as revolution in design helps people, it becomes the law. Electricity, mm -hmm. plumbing. Soon as it happens at that level, it stops being part of the design project and becomes code or law. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to find many architects at the center of that. You're not going to find many of William Morris's patterns at the center of that. You may find the idea of decoration at the center of that, wallpaper. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand why so much of our lives depend depend at the most fundamental level on not, let me put this a different way. The minute you start referring to the way art in the biggest sense, mm -hmm. and I know right now art is kind of in a nadir at the school, um, but I mean in, in the biggest sense, love. The way that, when, as soon as that starts to be referred to as enrichment, like there's the necessities of life, and then there's the enrichments of life. But you better take care of the necessities first, and everybody needs to have their necessities guaranteed. Then you have time for the enrichments. Then they're not paying attention to their lives. They're not paying attention to how many animals at every level of, of evolutionary development will die first for their enrichments before they will for their necessities. Why every lion that walks into a den will kill every, uh, you know, there's so much squandering of sexual material in order to protect the enrichments over the, you know, it's just, you have to just, you know, electrons and protons stay together out of love, not out of physics. You know, it's just so fundamentally mm -hmm. built in to, so there's, Mark Wigley and I are best friends as long as we're not in the same state with each other. He is a deeply committed to the blind gene theory. The gene causes everything. So for him it's the genome, so the phenome, the pheno, you know, the outside mm -hmm. of the, for me, no. So when you see two birds dancing their crazy head off so they can mate. He thinks the point of that is the babies. I think the point of the babies is so that those guys dance their heads off. Dance. Yeah. <laughs> like they're living for the dance. And that dance is, I mean, have you ever watched those bir birds dancing? I mean, it's an crazy, remarkable. And so a bird of paradise will, a female bird of paradise will sit on a limb and a male will come and hold its wings out for six hours, just trying to get it to, the female to do anything, and, and then the female will go, and then gone. And they'll go on for days. That, you know, and she'll finally, it will come along and she'll go, you know, I mean, it's just nightmarishly fantastic at the level of microscopic behaviors that you can never possibly relate to this specific gene or that specific gene. You know, it's, it's true that that's how selection happens, but it's all about the selection, not the thing that gets selected. That's how I see the world. Yeah, it's about the evolution. It's exactly <laughs> right. But evolution no, works like that. No, no, that you were saying that I remember um, about richness and, and, and yes, I, I remember a, 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 a quote by Pierre Bourdieu who says that Contrary to political revolutions, uh, cultural and technical revolutions are done by the richest ones. So 
Yes. But if we want to change, if we want the new to come, we have to enrich people yes. so they can yes. go to this revolution. And so we need, we need imagine, you know, that's why architects need to get out of economics. Mm -hmm. They're not good economists, but they need to insist on an economics that mobilizes all the practices that, you know, economics should not be a political practice. It should be an economic practice. That's why I, you don't need more money. You need more access to capital. Mm -hmm. And you need to expect access to capital often. And you need to understand it's not an entitlement. There should be circumstances that are going to produce it. You know, and, you know, for example, not taxing the state. Getting right, right now, the Trump tax law is about to eliminate state tax. That's, do you understand how horrible that idea is? That if, you, if your family gets rich, they'll keep that money in perpetuity forever. That's when a state tax is to guarantee that in a certain period of time, usually four generations, any accumulated wealth by a family, it's taxed away unless it continues to be productive. So in England, there's such a thing as a land hope. Like if you own property, you own it for 10,000 years or 1,000 years, and then you can lease it. It's ridiculous. These are ideas that are, even dinosaurs had better plans than this. You know, I mean, so, and architecture, of course, it's the only real, only real property, because it's attached to the land, that we psychologically and sociologically treat as personal property. You're from Mexico, so you barely, you think, because of earthquakes, <laughs> you barely treat it as, as yeah. real property. And, you know, it's here today and gone tomorrow. I mean. Yeah, but, but that, that, that's a, I, I'm going to, to use an example from just uh, after the earthquake. And I'm going to go back. It's not because I, I, I'm interested in him, but back to this guy, the mayor of Mexico City. His, his proposal for rebuilding the city is to grant um, mortgages to everyone in the city that lost their houses. Uh, <laughs> Get them in bigger debt. Yeah, they, they are changing houses for debt. And that's the way it's, it's, it's working in Mexico City, the idea for this guy, the idea of, 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 of re rebuilding the city. Uh, in a way, if we were speaking before about the idea of uh, evenly distributing the future or evenly distributing the access to some things that Maybe, maybe called future technology, uh, housing, or things like that, they are being st stopped by political and economical decisions. How can we change that with this slow evolution that you said it could be more threatened than the revolution from our discipline, from inside architecture, from mm -hmm. inside the disciplines of, the, of, of how, how do, you, do we have any opportunity to change that, or, or, or what do we do? Maybe that's the reason for my pessimism, that I don't find how, how, how to react to that. Well, because what you're asking for is, is there a way, and also is there an agency? Can you direct the mm -hmm. way? You know what? There is, and I don't know it. I'm just not that smart. But that's what, yes, there is. You know, one of my favorite moments is when I saw this in a movie, is when a student said to the teacher, is the teacher always smarter than the student? And the, student said, the teacher said, yes. And then the student said, the kid said, then why didn't Watt's teacher invent the steam engine? And I thought to myself, that's exactly right, and I'm that teacher. You know, I'm not going to invent the steam engine. I'm just going to torture and abuse all of you people enough <laughs> that you'll invent the steam engine just to show me, you asshole. You <laughs> That's what I want to do. So I've tried it nice and I've tried it mean. I'm, somehow or another, I'm going to find the right key where you'll just show me you're better than I am. Because, yes, it's obvious there's an answer to that. But what, there, what there's not going to be an answer to, like, I think you're asking me a question out of guilt. Future always shows up in guilt. Shouldn't we make a better world? Mm -hmm. And then somebody else is going to say, well, this world sucks. You know, one thing I can tell you is one of the things that's going on now is a tendency towards monoculture. Everybody should work. Be, right now, the problems are too severe. Scarce resources, global warming, uh, balkanization of all the states, uh, 
protein wars, seven and a half billion, nine billion by the time you're my age, 15 billion by the time your children or your, your children are teachers, 15 billion is the holding population of the earth. And you know, in a holding population, you get predator-prey dynamics, which means these kinds of population swings, which means the next population uh, after 15 billion is 5 billion. You know what I mean by that? You know what it's like to drop 10 billion people in 50 years? So when you hear those kinds of stories, you're going to move into a monoculture environment. You're not going to, you're not going to do what it takes to protect, protect the very world that produced that incredible wealth of richness of knowledge that we have now. The city developed as a human institution not out of rationality or economics. It, it happened because people could find opportunities to fulfill their desires to do what they want to do for a living. Not because they could make a better living, but because they could do other things. They didn't just have to farm or hunt. They could be jugglers. They could be prostitutes. They could be whatever. But they could make a living at something that they felt was who they were. And they did that until 1850 at the risk of their own lives. Until 1850, until Osman, beat the, <clears throat> Osman beat, built the sewers in Paris, the death rate of every city in the world was higher than the birth rate. Anybody that moved to a city took their lives at risk. And they did that so because it gave them the opportunity to live in a way that they felt like they wanted to live and could live. And that produced the greatest production in the history of humanity, of knowledge, art. So that diversity is the only thing that can keep us going and the only thing that can save us and the only thing worth living for anyway. So if you let the pressures of direct agency, like, we're, like future, force us into a monoculture thing. We gotta solve these problems, we gotta put everything else aside, we must recycle, we must you know, not that these things aren't important. We can do these things, all these things within a reasonably rational. I'm not a rationalist, you know? I'm a market person. Let's say you want to eat meat, and that is a total ridiculous amount of waste of resources, then you've got to walk to everywhere you go for the rest of your life. You've got to come, if you're going to come here from Mexico City, you've got to walk <laughs> here so you can eat steak. I mean, I don't care how you do it. Make up new stories. But, you know, don't rationalize yourself into slow death. This is one of the problems with the, a little bit with the Democrats' idea. If you're totally rationalized, it's just everybody dies slowly. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, you were trying to make me an optimist. That, 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 that's not the way. But, but, <laughs> but I was thinking about the idea of, of the city, and I agree completely with the idea that the city is a place where people gather to find new possibilities. And yes. We, and we try to, we are trying to At any to build, cost. But in, in our days, and I'm going back to, 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 to my city, and, but I don't think that my city is particular or exemplary in the way that it is the world's of the best city in the world. It's, it's a city it's like big. Every, other, every other big city. And it has problems that people cannot find the solution for any. For instance, there are uh, there's a, a neighbor, a, a borough of the city, uh, one of the most populated, almost three million people, one of the more, most poorest boroughs of the city, and is one of the boroughs that has water for one day out of seven. The richest people in the, in the city, they have water. It is not true because water is a huge problem in Mexico City, so maybe you don't have water, but you have the resources to pay it. And the, the water is being more expensive for the people with less resources than so for the people with money. Uh, to change that, you need, yes, politics, and yes, economics, uh, urban decisions, a lot of things, but you, know, you could also have uh, architectural agency. Like, what do you do, what would you what do? What agency? Uh, I, let me tell you. First of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something you're gonna hate me for, everybody in this room is gonna hate me for, but that's not a, why is that a problem? That's part of an incredibly thriving city. It's a bad situation. Yeah. It will get solved. I'm not sure anybody will solve it, but it'll get solved one way or another. You can't have somebody dying of thirst six out of seven days as a sustainable situation, but it's part of an incredibly successful um, 
ecosystem. So it's part of it, and the, it will have to get solved or the entire ecosystem will fall apart. It'll get solved by policy or war. It will not yeah. get solved by architectural agency. And I'll give you an example. The, and I don't know the, uh, what do you call those? The favelas in mm -hmm. Brazil? have been, I've seen the favelas in Brazil on architects' desks and in studios for so many years, I, I can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the drip down blue, you know, the blue tank systems that mm -hmm. were put in by that, and it was simply a gravitational drip down blue tank system, almost no cost whatsoever, was developed by um, that Swiss engineering mm -hmm. company. Uh, and all they did was just put those tanks in on every one and put, there, there's enough drip down gravitationally fed running water to put water in every favela. Uh, and all it really took was the development of the cost of that material to get cheap enough that they could put it in. And the minute it did, it got solved. And no one in the architecture world and no one in the politics of Brazil did that. And uh, it happened in one year, and you can read about it online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, so, all I know is that's not a problem. I know anyone in my field has anything like the expertise to conceptualize. It's not a violin that any violinist I know can play. Somebody else is gonna be playing that and it's a horrible situation. But raising it in this context is what I consider to be the problem. Acknowledge that if you wanna solve that problem, if you're drawn to that problem and you have any expertise in that problem, get out of here, go where that goes. Because bringing it here undermines the work that gets done here and doesn't get anything done to help there. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, I understand it. Your mayor's not doing it, you know? Yeah, I, I, I know that. And I, you know it's gonna happen, it's the same thing I'm gonna happen, they're gonna revolt, they're not gonna die. Yeah, sooner or later, that, 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 that's, but, but if that's a solution to the problem, a revolution, and now we're going back to revolution well, against evolution. Well, that's a evolution. terrible thing, yeah. That's uh, a, you know, what'll probably happen is a social media, you know, uh, the, most people don't remember that the Mongolian revolution, which was before so, social media happened because everyone in Mongolia had, a, for the first time ever, got, had a TV set and they mm -hmm. watched the uh, Soviet de fall apart. Mm -hmm. And so they saw on TV that there could be a revolution, and they had a velvet revolution no one knows about. Virtually no one in this country or in the West knows about a Mongolian revolution mm -hmm. that didn't happen because of tweeting, and it happened because they saw it on television, went out in the streets, and within a week, the government gave up. But if we believe to the, to, to, to the letter of, 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 of the song, revolution no. wouldn't be televised, no, it's, <laughs> but, but in, 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 the, in the difference between revolution and evolution, I, I, I want to stay there and, and, and with the idea of the future of architecture because if to have water in Mexico City, someone has to wait rather for the, a design solution, and I'm not calling that architecture, but a design solution, or a revolution because if not, they are going to die for, of, of thirst. Uh, how, come can, what, how can we believe in the, in the power of this slow evolution and the threat of evolution that you stated in the, in the beginning is, if I'm the one dying of thirst, I prefer a revolution than evolution. I do, I agree with you, but if you're the one dying of thirst in that sit, you have a cell phone, I guarantee you, you have a yeah. cell phone. You have a, you're active in evolutionary processes. What I wanna know is what's going on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not telling us the whole story. So yeah, I'm not telling you the whole, the whole story. They, they, but oh, I, what I am amazed of is How are that they, they're not, not drinking one day. They are buying the water, the, the water is, is, is arriving in, in, in tanks, in cars driving with tanks, and they are buying the water, a lot of more expensive than the water that the city should be providing them. And they are protesting, they are, they are making, but protests in their own borough. I haven't seen them, and I don't know why, but that's a problem with, with, with Mexican society, I don't understand why aren't they in the center of the city protesting for what is happening in the, in the borough? But, but for example, why do you not think, I'm, I'm always interested in this, why is it that you don't think beverage sales or chefs in restaurants, like why architects? You know, you don't see 
chefs well, wondering how they're going to solve the world's yeah, starvation yes. problem. Well, I, I, I know you, you, you saw maybe it's a very ridiculous and romantic and idealistic way to do it, but this, uh, this you, you have the, the documentary on Netflix of this the chef of uh, yes. Massimo Bottura making that in Milan, and he yes. does what he what, what he can. He takes the, the food that is. Uh, Yes. The rest of the food of one day, and no, then no, he feeds that, the people. There's a long history called the Harlequin. Starts with Escoffier, and mm -hmm. it's required. It was required in French law that yeah. you take all the leftover food yeah. at the end of the day, and you feed. You know, it became illegal in the United States because of sanitary laws. So you couldn't. So people had to starve so they didn't get sick. And Escoffier yeah. wrote his second textbook was how to uh, prepare. At the, at the request of the government, how to prepare rats in the uh, trenches for the French warfare so that, not so that they would taste good, <laughs> but so that they were sanitary. I yeah. mean, there is a, you're right about that. So, but there is no sense, we do it as a kind of stylistic guilt. I mean, yeah. I'm ashamed of it every time I hear it on a review and every time I, I'm not ashamed of students that want to be activists. I want them to be activists and I know that there will be some crossover, you know, yeah. and, but the other thing is, the other half of that is this. It's one thing to know that you don't have an agency where you wish you had, but it's another thing not to know the history of successful agency you've had almost since the very beginning of the discipline of accomplishing a fantastic level of economic, intellectual, existential, uh, affective enfranchisement and growth that's not a whole history of failure but a whole history of fantastic success virtually every place architecture has set foot yeah and to not know that and to not know you're standing on that kind of ground which is what enables you to wish you might have more in agency that's something else it's an incredible history of success now I'm being the optimist one because you said also before speaking about Physics failures. They're uh, they're, they're the, called the, null results. Yeah, but but failures is a, is, is a form of, of triggering success. Yes, yeah. no. In science, you don't call a, a null result. You went out to find something and you turned out it wasn't right. Or it's called a null result. You publish it, and then new knowledge is built on that null result. So Pilodi didn't actually release the ground. It didn't work, but we learned a whole new thing. So now we turn the ground into the building. I mean. None of that stops. You, people act like the researches of the five points have somehow ended, or the five point was some kind of dumb mistake, or some conceit on uh, Corbs. You know, you see it in every building. You mm -hmm. see it not not as a style, but as a way of thinking about every bit of it. And you know, the reason we don't care about the tops of buildings anymore is that the sky is just not interesting anymore. You know, we, we get up there or high, tall buildings yeah. suck. You know, so. All this stuff keeps going. But now going back to the idea of new architecture, and another idea, you, you said that when we arrive to, 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 to the moment, to the point when we have running water, running water becomes uh, distributed and coded and in those that it has to be equally distributed. Yes. Then so now the, the new and the, the, the political, the new that is political relevant in architecture becomes then something that is ripped off to society in another way by yes. the laws and, and, yes. and codes and economics yes. and politics. So, but finally, then we have an agency on all of that. In this discipline, that you, we, we invented the new here, and then it's coded, it's, it's driven into laws, it's, uh, it, it becomes an economic uh, opportunity. Well, this is, you know, this so, is something, that's why I was thinking about uh, Fisher. Yeah. The poor old feature that you, you, you don't like. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, if every audience has to be a big audience, mm -hmm. and that's the only way you measure it as being successful, mm -hmm. then he's probably right. Yeah. You know, what if he means is, if I, back in, you know, Led Zeppelin, if I'd sent Led Zeppelin back 15 years earlier and I'd hit Buddy Holly, it, it would have been amazing. Yeah. You know, and it, maybe if I'd even said, I don't know, I can't imagine it. My Generation was a song written by The Who, mm -hmm. by the way. Not your fucking generation. <laughs> you ain't got anybody who wrote something as good as The Who. <laughs> People try to bring me down. You know, this was a great song. Yeah, and before that, 15 years earlier, there was a song called, uh, uh, what was that thing called? 
I mean, just stupid songs. You can't believe this stuff. But, you know, Autecker, do you know Autecker? Mm -hmm. so send that back 15 years, find anything like it. Yeah. You know, or, I mean, it's just, so, but what's gonna happen is that audience is just gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you demand large audiences and big numbers, a million hits, six million views, if, if that's your measure of the only thing that counts as a success. What I count as a success is 15 people because what I know is in three years, it'll either be none, the likelihood are 10 to one for every 15 people, Bohemian Demimon, that's interested in something. Mm -hmm. In 15 minutes, it'll be none, but in 15 minutes, it could be, it could stay 15 people, but the next thing you know, it will be 3,000. And then it doesn't have to ever get the 3 million. 3,000, 4,000 people is enough for something to really matter in an existential framework. That's enough, you know. Um, Alexander McQueen doesn't have a gigantic audience, but everyone in this room, whether they know it or not, is affected by his, just for his work on women's fashion. Forget men's fashion. They, they don't know it that they know it. They don't know that they know Coco Chanel. They don't know that the freedom of a woman's body and clothing affects everybody here. They don't even know it if they see it. You know, so I don't need it to be, to, me, to me, meet the criteria. And I don't understand why anyone expects that in architecture. There's not a lot of good cases of that in architecture. Albert Kahn. Yeah, one yeah. good example I know of. Y'all got questions? This was good, I thought, don't you? <laughs> I don't think we ought to do Peter and the other. You know, I think this was like good. This was a great conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. So I don't need to go to Mexico now. <laughs> <laughs> you should go to Mexico. I'm we afraid. We invited you to Mexico. I'm afraid. There's too many people. 20, where you 20, put 20 22 million, million people. Where you put them all? Yeah. It's a huge city. And uh, 22 million people in a city that is in, 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 in uh, no more than two stories in, in, in average. We have parts of the are taller, but no the average is two stories, so it's an extended city. Yeah. Hernan knows it well. And he likes Mexico City. Oh. Go. Um, I, I have a question about the... Hold still. Hold, wait one second. You get a popsicle. Perfect. <laughs> now I can do it. Uh, I had a question about the... You, you, where, where you guys are interested in the production of the new and understanding what, what does it constitute to produce the new. Um, but I think what I'm interested in is that you were, you, it was more focused in, in terms of like the agency of architecture and understanding what its agency and what does it mean in terms of is architecture an evolution agent or a revolutionary agent? And uh, I think that it's an important matter because one of the things I was trying to answer at the start when you guys were talking was, but what does it really constitute to produce a new um, in this specific era? And I think. I think what happened was that I realized that we're in a, in a point where we're either trying to decide if we're evolutionists or revolutionaries. Um, and I think that's an, and uh, I think I'm, well, I think it's a problem actually. Um, oh, well, not, I'm not sure, but just th this notion of, do you think then are we producing in architecture in terms of finding a new agency or finding its existing agency or, and then if that's the case, then wh where, where does, the, does it lie in terms of the work? In some sort of way, if architecture is the production of evolutionary agents, um, in some sort of way, each work produced is just going to be, in a way, it's like they dance, the birds dance, he failed, that architecture didn't work, that, but the new bird came and he danced, and the new architecture w came to be. Um, so I, I think I'm just interested in this, in this understanding of understanding architecture as it's a revolutionary agency or is an evolutionary agency? Because the revolutionary agency, I think it deals more with this, uh, this notion of architecture trying to solve problems that might sometimes be out of the social political um, capabilities that architecture has. That's a, okay, that was great. Welcome to the school. Um, I'm not getting that's great. Here's a, here's a lesson for you, try to practice this. Every time you speak, don't try not to say just. Because when you say it's either just revolutionary or just versus it's revolutionary, it sounds really great and you get paid more if you don't say just. 
Try to get just, merely, simply, and only out of your sentences. Uh, you'll make a lot more money. <laughs> now, um, when Bernard Schumi started writing event theory and you know, cross-programming and all that sort of stuff, it was fantastic. Everybody thought this was a, that was a revolutionary idea. We were going to make buildings that produce revolutions. And what we were going to do was put running tracks in the middle of libraries. And, you know, and the idea, and I, I clung to it a long time much longer than I ever thought, realized how stupid I was. And I always had in my mind that, you know, this revolutionary architecture based on event theory was basically meant that every building we went into was going to cause us to immediately break out and start slam dancing into each other. You know, they, that's what a great building would do. And then I, it just dawned on me one day that that's just, how stupid could you be? You know, I mean, when you would go to these buildings that had the event theories realized, which is you'd go to a Cineplex, you know, and 12 different movies and shirt places and restaurants and noisy games. And you realize that that was event theory, and there it was right in front of your face. And not only did it suck and it didn't really do anything, it wasn't all that successful. <laughs> First, so it got tried out in rudimentary form. It was uh, revolutionary. And the revolution was instead of getting them to walk into the movie and actually having a nice arrival and sitting down and seeing a movie, you basically walked in a dead-end alley past two trash cans that said, feed me, and then snuck into the movie sideways, sat down, watched some suck-ass movie that, you know, wasn't so great, you know. But it did set into motion that we could think about program in a different way and started to do stuff. So there, that revolutionary theory got tested, worked out, failed mostly, did some succeeding, turned every museum into a, a, a front for a bookshop, um, got appropriated by mall developers better than it did by architects, but then taught us how to think about program in a different way, and now has now become a microevolutionary attitude. So I think if you go back and look at the history of it, it usually starts for all kinds of academic, theatrical, necessary reasons in revolutionary terms, but quickly re matures for those people that are genuinely interested in following it into uh, evolutionary techniques. And that's, you know, like all the all single service, all the problems that we do, that's generally what happens until it, the problems get solved. And the problems don't end or we don't get bored with them. They get solved and we know them and they get appropriated by uh, first adopting practices and then they get generalized into things. So I think you're right. And I think it's good that you're thinking that way. So you're at the right place. Yep. That's the most questions I've ever got. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so what would you both define as uh, the agency of, the, of architecture? The, is the what? Architecture's agency. Is that which is Council what is architecture? I mean, you talked about how you know it shouldn't take the place of what will become either policy or war. That's, I, I, I agree with you in that, and I think that was very strong and, and decisive, and definitive. But that's saying what architecture's agency is not. So, what is architecture's agency then? What are its possible agencies? There yeah. are lots of them. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just whichever come to mind for you now. I. I what I think is that it's different to think of architecture agencies, and I, I, I agree, and architects' agencies. Because we tend to, to, to uh, well, I, I don't like the confusion between architecture and architects. I think that architecture is broader than architects. An architecture agency, it's what a lot of people is doing by the simple fact of trying to transform the built world where we live. An architect's agency, it's, I think, that has to, to do with, for me, and at least, with a clear, I was going to say political, but political in the broader sense, position. What, what is what you're doing, doing? But to, to state it clearly, to do. I, I don't know, I, when, when someone says, I, I, I like to, to think that when someone says that he wants to do something, he has to prove it 
in the realm that he states he's acting. It's like defining the, 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 the field when you're acting. So I don't think that it's, there's a architecture agency or architect's agency that you can point out with like that precise agency. You have to choose it, I think so, and state it. That's depressing. It's depressing. You're depressing. I, I know. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me just make it. Uh, I try to develop. First of all, you have to. Anyone here write poetry? Do you read it? You read, you read other poets, right? So read, that's good. But So you know what I'm about to say. The only people that read poetry are poets. And so I can ask you, what's the agency of poetry? So the fact of the matter is, the first, role, the first level of agency for architects is to produce projective relationships with other architects. So for the most part, the field of agency is one architect talking to other architects about possible agencies. First, most of the work is communicating one between architects at the level of the project, not at the level of the building and not at the level of a larger social audience. So the entire single surface, 15 years of single surface projects, which is something like 1,000 projects and like 85 to 100 buildings, that was one architect talking to another architect about this surface that could produce what I called an imaginal field. Not imaginary, but an imaginal, and that is, a surface that people would not be able to stop and think floor, ceiling, and wall, but that was a continuous surface so that they would continuously imagine collectivities that couldn't possibly exist. And could architecture enact those in a building in such a way as to produce these imaginal collectivities so collectivities no longer needed to be physical and actual. And so it worked at the architectural co communication level for a long time, then it started to get built. And it worked more or less. You can decide for yourself if you think single surface buildings. No one ever thought you would walk up the building. No one was really interested in tearing down the semiotics of a floor, a ceiling, and a wall. I got you. You can put your hand down. I got you. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, there was a lot of interest in this notion of an, of an imaginal effect. And the same thing is true for some, you know, so like. Disney Hall or you know, collectivities that produces new forms of temporary unities. So there are these kinds of agencies that discussed among architects to see, do you think this might work if we took it to the public? Is there a way to bring people together in a music hall that are su from such diverse communities that perhaps the architecture, by showing the formal relationship to so many diverse forms in the, in the city and by entering in so many different ways, and then you put them in this one space, and, and for a moment they're brought together by music. It worked in Sharoon's concert hall, could have been made to work in Disney Hall. So that kind of discussion goes on all the time. So I think that agency is important. So you see museums now, so that when you walk in the gallery, you walk in in such a way that you are seen through a transparent wall, so other people in the gallery see you walking in, and they see you framed by the, the doorway as a work of art. And all of a sudden, as you're there in the gallery and you're walking through, you become a work of art. So these kinds of small ephemeral relationships are worked out all the time. That's the level of agency that I think works at the level of cultural and critic, not post-critical agency, but mostly discussed at the level of a project and in terms of psycho-optical and sociological level, and then tried out and oftentimes not panned out. The Mobius House by uh, Caroline and um, Ben. First time ever that the Mobius effect was actually not reproduced in some kind of bad geometry, but actually produced in a building so that as you were walking out, you could feel yourself walking back in because of the way the reflectivity. So yes, but the way that I would answer your questions is it's usually internal and at a very small scale at the level of very subtle counterintuitive effects. And then some effort is to make these grow into very much larger coherent, big uh, political or social effects as they mature. Is that any better? Um, I'm older. Um, yeah. I, had, I had a question. Nice dress. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I like flowers. <laughs> um, Hernan used to use them. Yeah. 
so the realm of architecture has a certain finite extent, especially in the political ecosystem. And you said that if that ecosystem in some sense is not working or failing, then it's not an architectural problem. But I believe that, I mean, again, it's a question, but I believe that architects should at least have a stand on, like a very objective stand on some things, politically and sociologically and or economically. Um, there is one firm that comes to mind, it's called Emergency Architecture, and they work in war-torn areas and create schools in like months for kids um, who, who are orphans. Or I think that's, in some sense, is yes, taking a yes. stand. Yes, listen, architects should be decent human beings. And if they have a skill that they can use to help other human beings decently, they should use it. The, the, the woman in, um, the first architect in, uh, Pakistan, who set her side, she's the AIA, head of the AIA in Pakistan, built all those uh, um, bamboo structures, invented a new bamboo structure. You know, she she's builds all the Hyatt hotels, but she also developed, and so she does very horrible corporate architecture. But um, she also understood that there was a responsibility, and she had the intelligence to do building projects for poor people that they were not particularly important to architecture, but they were using her skills at understanding materials and buildings to make them useful in relationship to other, yeah, you're right. So human beings should rise to the occasion of being decent human beings with whatever knowledge and skill they have. But that's not the same thing as architectural agency though. If you have money, you give money. If you have skills, you give skills. Yes, you're right, absolutely. This school and all other schools do that, do every, does everything it can to get you involved in every possible way in social action, whether it's Habitat for Humanity or, give, or taking seriously the events in Houston. And you notice we don't even talk about Houston anymore. You know, uh, thank God Puerto Rico wasn't as bad as uh, New Orleans. <laughs> what an idiot our president is, it's, it's hilarious. Um, you know, but I mean, of course, yeah, be a decent human being and don't use your profession as an excuse. Just be a decent human being and do your profession and understand that they're two different things. I'm done. Bye. <laughs>